With everything going on around NASA's Artemis program lately, a lot of people are asking the same thing. When will the moon landing realistically happen? Well, wonder no more, because the latest SpaceX HLS timeline may finally give us a real answer. There's been some chatter about an internal SpaceX document outlining the company's updated timeline for getting humans back on the moon. According to the document, SpaceX is aiming to attempt an in-space propellant transfer between two starships in June 2026, a pretty critical step for its lunar ambitions. Then, if things stay on track, an uncrewed lunar landing is planned for June 2027, and the big milestone, landing astronauts on the moon, would be as early as September 2028. SpaceX plans to roll these updated dates into an integrated master schedule it's delivering to NASA in December. After that, the company will work with NASA to revise its current contract and make the new timeline official. Until then, the document makes it clear, these dates are goals, not yet approved contract milestones. Interestingly, this updated timeline lines up pretty closely with what NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, ASAP, estimated back in September. That assessment came after three ASAP members visited SpaceX's Starbase site in Boca Chica, Texas, where they met with senior SpaceX leaders. They were impressed by the pace of manufacturing and operations, but still came away saying the schedule for the human landing system, HLS, is significantly challenged. ASAP meets privately with NASA and other officials every quarter, then follows up with a public phone briefing to share their insights. About a week after one of those meetings, members Paul Hill, Kent Rominger, and Charlie Precourt headed to Starbase. Hill is a former NASA flight director and the former director of mission operations at Johnson Space Center, while Rominger and Precourt are both former astronauts. Hill explained that their main job was to evaluate whether Starship HLS could realistically be ready for Artemis III in mid-2027, the mission meant to return U.S. astronauts to the lunar surface for the first time since Apollo. At Starbase, they met with SpaceX's VP of Starship Engineering, Bill Riley, Starship HLS Program Manager, Artie Matthews, and VP of Build and Reliability, Bill Gerstenmeier. They were genuinely impressed by what Hill described as SpaceX's multifaceted, self-perpetuating genius, especially its overall strategy for boosting manufacturing speed and reliability. Still, despite the praise, they saw the odds of Starship HLS being ready by 2027 as pretty doubtful. As Hill put it, The HLS schedule is significantly challenged and, in our estimation, could be years late for a 2027 Artemis III moon landing. On-orbit cryopropellant transfer is critical to the HLS mission and absolutely must succeed for Artemis III. But there are several threats to achieving that. Timely development of Starship version 3, which is first scheduled to fly next month. A reliable flight demonstration of the version 3 tanker and depot configurations, both of which need major upgrades. And successful performance and reliability improvements for the Raptor version 3 engines. Cryotransfer is the process Starship will use to refuel in Earth orbit before heading to the moon or deeper into the solar system. Even though Starship is incredibly powerful, it can only make it to low Earth orbit with enough fuel left to return and be reused. To go any farther, it needs to top off its tanks in space. Starship runs on super cold liquid methane and liquid oxygen. These cryogenic propellants slowly boil off over time, and since no one has ever transferred them in microgravity before, we still don't know exactly how many tanker launches will be required for a lunar mission. The current plan, which involves sending 10 to 20 tanker starships to dock directly with the lunar lander, raises understandable concerns. Each docking and fuel transfer adds another point of possible failure, whether from alignment issues, valve problems, or cryogenic handling glitches. Space missions rely on extremely high reliability, so putting the mission-critical lander through that many operations feels unnecessarily risky. A more practical solution is to use a dedicated propellant depot starship as a buffer. This depot would launch first and get filled up by those 10 to 15 tanker visits. If something goes wrong during those uncrewed dockings, the tanker can simply try again without jeopardizing the main mission. Then, the lunar lander only needs to dock once with the depot for a single, clean transfer. This setup keeps the complicated, repetitive work away from crewed hardware and reduces the number of high-stakes steps. 
NASA has already pointed out that depots are the long-term path to sustainable deep space missions. And with SpaceX's fast launch cadence, multiple tankers can be ready to ensure the depot is filled reliably. If the schedule holds, the first in-space propellant transfer between two starships could happen in June 2026. NASA says SpaceX will launch two starships a few weeks apart, have them dock autonomously, and attempt to move up to 1,500 tons of propellant between them. Engineers will use this test to see how well the system controls boil-off and, ultimately, to refine estimates for how many tanker flights will be needed to fully load an orbital depot. Now, SpaceX has to develop two key Starship variants, a lunar lander and a dedicated refueling tanker. From here on out, expect their test flights to focus heavily on propellant transfer, landing legs, and the hot gas thrusters needed for lunar landings. Even though a 2028 landing sounds a bit late compared to NASA's current 2027 Artemis III target, the truth is that the original schedules were never realistic. The first date, 2024, was impossible from the start, and 2027 isn't much better. A no earlier than 2028 timeline has always been the most grounded expectation. And of course, space projects almost always slip. That's the nature of doing things that have never been done before. NASA took a risk choosing Starship, but it's a risk that's likely to pay off, just not instantly. In the worst case, Starship could land humans on the moon around 2030. China might get boots on the lunar surface first, but their lander will be more comparable to the Apollo-era spacecraft. Small, limited, and straightforward. Meanwhile, the U.S. would be landing a structure the size of a 15-story building. That's why these leaked and internal SpaceX timelines are so exciting. They show real, steady progress toward getting humans back to the moon. Elon Musk and the SpaceX team are pushing boundaries that no one else is even attempting turning what used to sound like science fiction into something tangible. With a propellant transfer demo planned for June 2026, an uncrewed landing in 2027, and a crewed mission in 2028, the momentum is undeniable. This is the bold kind of vision that moves space exploration forward, far beyond the cautious, incremental approach we've been used to seeing. I'm also really curious how many launches SpaceX plans to squeeze in between each of these milestones. Once they start catching the second stage, launch frequency could ramp up fast. What do you think? Drop your best guesses in the comments. SpaceX has confirmed that it's already assembling the first flight-ready Starship HLS, complete with avionics, power systems, life support, communications gear, and thermal regulation hardware. This initial module will form the backbone of a series of integration tests and astronaut training exercises leading up to the first crewed lunar landing. According to the company, SpaceX's HLS team has already completed 49 major milestones covering everything from subsystem design to on-the-ground infrastructure and mission operations. SpaceX only gets paid when each milestone is successfully met, and most of them have been finished on or ahead of schedule, something you don't often see in aerospace. A lot of these milestones dive deep into the practical realities of lunar missions. Engineers have been running full-scale life support demonstrations inside a mock cabin using real people to test atmosphere control, sanitation, humidity management, and temperature regulation, all while measuring how loud the internal environment gets during operations. They've qualified the docking adapter that will let Starship link up with Orion in orbit, using an androgynous system based on the proven Dragon 2 docking mechanism. Landing tests have also been underway, including dropping full-scale landing legs onto simulated lunar soil to understand how they absorb impact and interact with regolith, and firing Raptor engines through a throttle profile designed specifically for lunar touchdown. Other testing has focused on making sure the spacecraft can survive and operate in deep space. Engineers have blasted shielding, insulation, and window materials with micrometeoroid-sized projectiles and extreme temperatures to refine the protective layers Starship will need. Navigation sensors, radar, and landing software have gone through extensive demonstrations to ensure Starship can locate and precisely target a landing site on the moon. 
SpaceX also completed a full architecture review of the onboard software system to map out every major control function, the computers that run them, and the safety nets built into fault detection and caution and warning systems. They've even chilled Raptor engines before firing them to simulate cold starts after long periods in space, ensuring they can reliably restart during the lunar mission. Mission planners from SpaceX and NASA have gone through a comprehensive review of how the integrated lunar campaign will operate, including crew procedures, flight rules, and the overall mission flow. Beyond the lander itself, SpaceX has tested the electrical power generation and distribution hardware planned for the future propellant depot Starship. Ground-to-vehicle communications have been validated through RF testing using flight-equivalent hardware on both ends. And in a particularly important step for surface operations, SpaceX and Axiom teamed up to test a flight-representative elevator and airlock system using real EVA suits, rehearsing how astronauts and cargo will move between Starship's pressurized cabin and the lunar surface. Even the medical systems and telemedicine links have gone through their own demonstrations to ensure crews can receive support from Earth when they need it. Taken together, these milestones show a program moving steadily, from hardware to systems to operations, toward the moment humans once again set foot on the moon. If the US and China reach the moon around the same time, the big question becomes how they avoid stepping into conflict. Lunar exploration in the 21st century is very different from the Apollo era. Multiple nations now want not just to visit the moon, but to stay. Both the US and China, along with partners on each side, plan to build permanent bases at the lunar south pole, an area with scarce but highly valuable resources. That region contains abundant water ice locked in permanently shadowed craters. This ice could support long-term habitation, provide drinking water, and be split into hydrogen and oxygen to make rocket fuel. There may also be valuable minerals, including rare earth elements, but the moon has only so many resource-rich sites, only so many flat areas suitable for landers, and only so much ice to go around. When multiple powers compete for limited territory and resources, the potential for conflict is real. Still, cooperation is possible. International agreements, if respected, can keep the moon peaceful. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty already states that space cannot be claimed by any nation and that its use is for the benefit of all countries. But it also leaves open the question of how resources like lunar ice can be used without violating those principles. The Artemis Accords, led by the U.S., attempt to clarify this. They argue that extracting lunar resources doesn't count as national appropriation and allow the creation of temporary safety zones around active operations to prevent interference. Critics worry that these zones could turn into de facto territorial claims, but the accords do require transparency and coordination. As of now, 56 nations have signed, including Thailand and Senegal, countries that also participate in China's lunar base project and may serve as bridges between the two programs. Another framework already exists, the 1979 Moon Agreement. It calls for openness, information sharing, and a global approach to managing lunar resources. Its biggest weakness is that the US, China, and Russia never signed it. Even so, it may offer the clearest foundation for a cooperative lunar future, especially if a few articles are updated for modern needs. What's certain is that a first-come, first-served approach won't work. When humans step onto the moon, they'll all be terrestrials not representatives of competing land grabs. Space can amplify rivalry, but it can just as easily serve as a platform for diplomacy, shared science, and economic development. The choice, ultimately, is ours.